Hi, thanks for joining me. My name is Mindy Mandel and this channel is all about Platonism. And now we're getting into the Republic Book 3. So just a quick recap to make sure we're all on the same page. We saw that Socrates was given the challenge of trying to show that justice in and of itself is worthwhile, whether or not a person has the reputation of being just. And so to make his case, Socrates set up an analogy of a city-state to the soul because he wanted to focus on the soul and show what, the way he understands soul to be and what, the way he understands justice to be a virtue in the soul. And so he's very gradually building his story about the city-state, and as he's doing this, he's also gradually building for us an image of the soul. And so we saw that he built his city-state to the point of where we needed guardians or soldiers to protect the city, which would be analogous to something in the, in the soul that would protect the soul, keep it whole. And then we started talking about the education of the soul. And we saw that um, kicking out or exiling the poets in the city-state was analogous to purging false beliefs from the soul. And that was where we ended last week. And now we're going to continue with the education of the soul with this idea of music. And in, in regards to these warriors, he says they need to be brave if they're going to be good soldiers. And so the stories that they learn must be stories that will instill courage in them. And all of our translations, by the way, are by Paul Shorey. And as I've been doing in the past videos on the Republic, I'm adjusting these translations so that they're in script form for our ease. But otherwise, I'm sticking strictly to the translation of Paul Shorey. Okay, so Socrates says that if they, the guardians, are to be brave, must we not extend our prescription to include also the things that will make them least likely to fear death? Or do you suppose that anyone could ever become brave who had that dread in his heart? Now, the sayings that he's referring to, we saw last time, were these core beliefs about the nature of reality. And there were two of them. If you want a more detailed discussion of them, that is in the last video on the Republic. And so I invite you to watch that. But just very briefly, as a summary here, um, the first law was that God is good and the cause of only good things. The second law was that God would never change shape or deceive us or alter in any way. So from here, Socrates gives a bunch of examples from Homer that he feels um, would instill fear in people who believe these passages, that they would cause us to fear death. And he thinks these are no good. And so I'm going to show you some of those. But before I do, I want to show you this little conversation that took place right after. So after giving a bunch of examples from Homer, Socrates asks, we must remove those things then? Yes. And the opposite type to them is what we must require in speech and in verse. And Eddie Montes replies, obviously. So we're going to go back and look at a few of these examples from Homer, but what we want to do with them is think about what they're saying about the afterworld and then think what is the opposite, because what Socrates is saying here is that if we see the opposite, then we will have something that is consistent with those two laws about the nature of reality. And by the way, about those laws, we're not expected to just blindly believe them. It's more that this is something that we're going to come to understand. That is wisdom. But initially, you may have a sense that there's something right about it, and that's enough to go forward. Or you may even just treat them as hypotheses that you want to test. And that would be enough for somebody to keep going. A person who rejected them altogether, of course, is probably not going to choose the Platonic path to spirituality. But if you at least accept them as hypotheses, you can go forward. Okay, with that in mind, here's one example from Homer. So this is at 386D in the Republic, but it comes out of the Iliad. Lest unto men and immortals the homes of the dead be uncovered, horrible, noisome, dank, that the gods too hold in abhorrence. 
So we're seeing here a description, the homes of the dead, so the afterworld. And it's described as a horrible place, and it's noisy and dank, and even the gods hate it. So if we want to turn that around, we might come up with something like this. And this is just my words. Hades is welcoming, and it's bright, and it's loved by the gods. This saying is consistent with the idea that God is good and only the cause of good things and would never change, form, or deceive us. Here's another example, also from the Iliad. Ah, me, so it is true that even in the dwellings of Hades, spirit there is in wraith, but within there is no understanding. So here's a description of Hades where you have spirit and wraith, which is like the ghost form, like the form of the human without the physical form. But there's no understanding, no mind. But if you've watched any of my past videos, if you've gotten anything out of my discussion of Platonic metaphysics, any understanding at all, you know that, that the realm of mind is seen as the realm of the absolute realities. And each progression afterwards is a manifestation, if you will, of that reality. Each, each realm afterwards has a mode of reality, but is not ultimate reality. And so the very opposite of this is what Plato would agree to. Something like this. There is no body in the next world, only mind. Okay, in addition to these guardians, and we haven't yet quite defined what they represent in the soul, when, except for this general sense that they protect the soul, keep it whole, um, in addition to being brave, they also need self-control or what in other videos I've called temperance. And so he gives this example, also from the Iliad. Heavy with wine, with the eyes of a dog and the heart of a fleet deer. So somebody described as cowardly and perhaps drunk. I'm not really sure what eyes of a dog means here. But then Socrates says that any words or deeds of endurance in the face of all odds attributed to famous men are suitable for our youth to see represented and to hear. And then here's an example of one that Socrates approves of. He smote his breast and chided thus his heart. Endure, my heart, for worse hast thou endured. So these teachings are good, but not ones that teach being cowardly. Also, he's against stories that teach that it's okay to take bribes or to be greedy for gain. And he says that these sorts of teachings are harmful to those that hear them. For every man will be very lenient with his own misdeeds if he's convinced that such are and were the actions of the near-sown seeds of God, close kin to Zeus. In other words, if we believe that the gods act in ways that are greedy or cowardly, then we will feel, well, if they can be this way, then surely, you know, I'm only human. You can, I'll forgive myself and we'll let ourselves off the hook and be too lenient with ourselves. And so after going through various examples of the right or wrong ways to speak, he asks what type of discourse remains for our definition of our prescriptions and proscriptions. We've declared the right way of speaking about gods and daimons and heroes in that other world. We have. Speech then about men would be the remainder. However, they have a problem here because in order to talk about the best speech about humans, and by the way, of course, throughout the Republic and actually all of Plato's dialogues, the male nouns and pronouns should be taken lightly. Of course, these were before the days of political correctness. So here he's talking about humans, not just men. And so in order to talk about humans, we'd have to agree already to the conclusion of the person who is truly just. And since we'd be putting the cart before the horse, if we did that, we're going to have to skip that discussion. He says, as regards men, that speech must be of this kind. That is a point that we will agree upon when we've discovered the nature of justice and the proof that it is profitable to its possessor, whether he does or does not appear to be just. So with this, they're going to put aside, they're complete now with what they want to say about the kind of speech 
that is acceptable, the kinds of um, beliefs that are consistent with the laws about the nature of reality that were introduced before. So now that they put aside what, what should be said, they're now going to talk about how. And he says, this concludes the topic of tales. That's the what. And that of diction, I take it, is to be considered next. This brings us into the how. And the how is actually going to be broken down into three parts. And being consistent with his analogy of the city-state to the soul, he's going to talk about diction, harmony, and rhythm. But as we go through this, we need to keep asking ourselves, what is he really saying about the soul? Okay, so starting with diction, he's going to give some example of what he means, and he's going to draw from the introduction or the very first opening of the Iliad. Now, if you have read the Iliad and you're familiar with it, that might give it a little more color, a little more texture, this example, because you will recognize it. However, if you're not familiar with the Iliad, that is fine. You'll still understand the point that Plato is making here. So Socrates says, You know then that as far as these verses, and prayed unto all the Achaeans, chiefly to Atreus' his son, twin leaders who marshaled the people. Homer himself is the speaker and does not even attempt to suggest to us that anyone but himself is speaking. But what follows, he delivers as if he himself were the character crisis, and he tries as far as may be to make us feel that not Homer is the speaker, but the priest, an old man. And so there's two forms of diction here. There are places where Homer is the narrator speaking in his own voice. And there are places where he takes on the voice and characteristics of a character in his story, and there he is doing imitation. And so Socrates is going to talk about these two things, narration and imitation. And he says about imitation, and is not likening oneself to another in speech or bodily bearing, an imitation of him to whom one likens oneself? Okay, so there we have a definition of imitation. And then after speaking a little more about this, he goes on to ask, do we wish our guardians to be good mimics or not? Or is this also a consequence of what we said before? that each one could practice well only one pursuit and not many. But if he attempted the latter, dabbling in many things, he would fail of distinction in all. So here's a theme that's been coming up over and over. The idea that being that doing one thing well is ideal. That if we try to do many things, like a farmer trying to do other things besides farming, or a builder doing other things besides building, then we're going to fail at everything. So that theme has come up before. It's going to keep coming up. We'll see it here with imitation as well, because Adimantus agrees that, of course, that's right. And then Socrates goes on, does not the same rule hold for imitation? That the same man is not able to imitate many things well as he can one? No, he is not. Still less than Will he be able to combine the practice of any worthy pursuit with the imitation of many things and the quality of a mimic? So this idea of imitation is actually going to come up throughout the dialogue. When we get to books 8 and 9, we're going to see Socrates setting up different types of government, different states or constitutions, and he's playing on those words because they have a dual meaning. You can talk about a political constitution and you can talk about a person's constitution or a political state and a person's state of mind and he's playing on that double meaning so we're going to see very um, different um, constitutions or states and we're going to see that what causes them to degrade is largely through imitation or imitation plays a key role in that degradation and Socrates goes on to say that still smaller coinage than this, in my opinion, Edimontus, proceeds the fractioning of human faculty, so as to be incapable of imitating many things or of doing the things themselves of which the imitations are likenesses. 
So the ideal is to to act from what he was, was calling narration in his analogy. And this is when we're speaking from a, and speaking and acting from a place that is genuine and uh, spontaneous. But if we do have to imitate, he says, then we should imitate from childhood up what is appropriate. Men, that is, who are brave, sober, pious, free, and all things of that kind. But things unbecoming the free man, they should neither do nor be clever at imitating, nor yet any other shameful thing, lest from the imitation they imbibe the reality. And here's a key line. Have you not observed that imitations, if continued from youth far into life, settle down into habits and second nature in the body, the speech and the thought? So what we're seeing here, what Plato is recognizing here, is that in our childhood we pick up many different mannerisms and beliefs from our families. And that becomes our our view of the way things are. That becomes what distorts our view of reality and the way we see the world, our interpretation of the world. Uh, We learn things so young that we don't even realize we learned them. They just seem like that's the way things really are. So this has far-reaching meaning in our lives, but Plato is specifically focusing on those false beliefs that deal with the nature of reality and would pull us away from the two laws that I covered last week and that I briefly reviewed at the beginning of this video. He says, there is a form of diction and narrative in which the really good and true man would narrate anything that he had to say, and another form unlike this, to which the man of the opposite birth and breeding would cleave, and in which he would tell his story. And so the ideal that they agree on finally at the end of all of this is that the narrative that he will employ, the guardian will employ, will be the kind that we just now illustrated by the verses of Homer, and his diction will be one that partakes of both, of imitation and simple narration. But there will be a small portion of imitation in a long discourse, or is there nothing in what I say? Okay, so narration is the best, acting from a place that is genuine. The more that we can purge those false beliefs, which he symbolized in his analogy, as exiling the poets from our city-state, the more we can purge and purify ourselves, the more we will act from a place that is genuine. But there'll always be a little bit of imitation. It's We're human, and we're always... The ego is never fully um, disassembled, at least not on a... You know, as we're, at, we're functioning in the world. And so there'll be some imitation, but it should be the best kind of imitation. And then going on from here, he's going to go on to what he calls harmony and to see what he means here. And you don't have to know music here. He's looking at different kinds of modes of music. You don't have to know these modes. What you want to follow here is that he's looking at different attitudes or states of mind. So let's take a look at some examples of how he talks about these modes of music or the harmony. He says, but we said... We did not require the dirges and lamentation in words. We do not. What, then, are the dirge-like modes of music? Tell me, for you are a musician. And Edimontus replies, the mixed Lydian and the tense or higher Lydian in similar modes. But again, drunkenness is a thing most unbefitting guardians, and so is softness in sloth. Yes. What, then, are the soft and convivial modes? Well, there are certain Ionian and also Lydian modes that are called lax. Will you make any use of them for warriors? None at all. Okay, so again, it doesn't matter if you know these Lydian modes or these Ionian modes. What's important to see here is that there are certain attitudes that Socrates is saying are not fitting for the guardian. And so what he ultimately agrees on is there are two modes of music. Let's go through this, and then I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit. I don't know the musical modes, but leave us that mode that would fittingly imitate the utterances and the accents of a brave man 
who is engaged in warfare or in any enforced business, and who, when he has failed, either meeting wounds or death or having fallen into some other mishap, in all these conditions confronts fortune with steadfast endurance and repels her strokes. And leave another mode for such a man engaged in works of peace, not in force but voluntary, either trying to persuade somebody of something or imploring him, whether it be a god through prayer or a man by teaching and admonition, or contrariwise, yielding himself to another who is petitioning or teaching him, or trying to change his opinions, and in consequence faring according to his wish, in not bearing himself arrogantly, but in all this acting modestly and moderately and acquiescing in the outcome. So there's quite a bit here to go back over. But basically, you notice here that there are two modes, and one he's calling the enforced mode. This is whenever we are confronting some difficulty. It might be in the external world, or it might be something within us. Some situations cause us stress or cause us um, some sort of uh, mental anguish or cause us pain, like the death of a loved one. And so here he's talking about the state of mind or the attitude with which we would confront these sorts of difficulties. And then the other one he's calling voluntary, which here is more of like the peaceful or the more pleasant situations. And this type of examples he's talking about are times when we are, say, appealing to higher forces, um, looking for wisdom, or when we are functioning as a student or when we're functioning as a teacher and the attitude that we would have in those situations. So here we've already seen the kind of language or the kind of teachings, the kind of beliefs that are ideal. And now we're seeing a little bit more about the behavior, what he calls diction and what he's here calling harmony. When we go on to rhythm, we'll be able to bring it all together a bit more. So he says, let us complete the purifications. Remember, all of this is about purification, purging false beliefs and ignorance from the soul. He says, upon harmonies would follow the consideration of rhythms. So we've seen diction and harmonies. We're going on to rhythms. We must not pursue complexity nor great variety in the basic movements, but must observe what are the rhythms of a life that is orderly and brave, and after observing them, require the foot and the air to conform to that kind of man's speech and not the speech to the foot and the tune. We'll talk a little bit more about the order that these take in our lives. Um, I'll speak more on that in a moment. But here we see rhythms is something like the temperament of the person. And he doesn't say a whole lot here about rhythms. He says far less about rhythm than he did about diction or harmony. Here's one little bit of what he says here. On this point, we will take counsel with Damon. Damon was a sophist of Socrates' day who was considered an expert on music, and Socrates often cited him whenever he talked about music. So we'll take counsel with Damon too as to which are the feet appropriate to liberality and insolence and madness and the other, other evils, excuse me, and what rhythms we must leave for their opposites. So the feet here is um, matching to the harmonies in that last quote. So the harmony and the rhythm are closely tied together. He says, in, he gives some examples and then says, in some of these, I believe he censured and commended the tempo of the foot no less than the rhythm itself, or else some combination of the two, I can't say. But as I said, let this matter be postponed for Damon's consideration. For to determine the truth of these would require no little discourse. Do you think otherwise? No, by heaven I do not. But this you're able to determine, that seemliness and unseemliness are attendant upon the good rhythm and the bad. So he says very little about the rhythm, but it seems to be the temperament of the person, and it's closely tied to the harmony, which is something like the attitudes of the person. 
And so now talking a bit about the way to order these in our mind of what leads to what. Further, that good rhythm and bad rhythm accompany the one fair diction, assimilating itself thereto, and the other the opposite, and so of the apt and the unapt. If, as we were just now saying, the rhythm and harmony follow the words, and not the words these. They certainly must follow the speech. And what of the manner of the diction and the speech? Do they not follow and conform to the disposition of the soul? So he brought in something new there. Of course, and all the rest to the diction? Yes. Just one more step. Good speech, then, good accord and good grace and good rhythm wait upon a good disposition, not that weakness of head which we euphemistically style goodness of heart, but the truly good and fair disposition of the character and the mind. And so to just summarize all of that, it was rather complex there, but we can just break it down in this simple way here. He's saying that the disposition of the soul is at the base of it all here, and at, and that leads us to our words and speech, and based on that, our attitudes and temperament. And we saw that at the root of all of this are our beliefs. Our beliefs lead us to a certain disposition. If we have a healthy state of mind, or if we have a healthy soul, with, um, not infected with ignorance, we're going to have a healthy disposition. Our words and speech are reflections of that, the manifestations of our beliefs, and our attitudes and temperament, our behavior, will follow that. He says, education in music is most sovereign, because more than anything else, rhythm and harmony find their way to the inmost soul and take strongest hold upon it, bringing with them and imparting grace, if one is rightly trained, and otherwise the contrary. And so all of this leads our beliefs, our words and speech, our behavior and mannerisms, all of this is reflected as our character. And here we bring it all together of what music is. He says, Then by heaven am I not right in saying that by the same token we shall never be true musicians either, neither we nor the guardians that we've undertaken to educate until we are able to recognize the forms of soberness, courage, liberality, and high-mindedness, and all their kindred, and their opposites too, and all the combinations that contain and convey them, and to apprehend them in their images wherever found, disregarding them neither in trifles nor in great things, but believing the knowledge of them to belong to the same art and discipline." And so we see that this education in music is an education in states of mind and understanding what it is that contributes or builds our state of mind, the various elements of our state of mind, being able to recognize it in ourselves and recognize it in others. And then he ends the section on music by saying, do you not agree then that our discourse on music has come to an end? It has certainly made a fitting end, for surely the end and consummation of culture, or what in other translations is education, is the love of the beautiful. Now, if you've read the symposium or saw my video on it, you know that for Socrates, the love of the beautiful is raising this education in music to something spiritual, something divine. And so that is where we're going to end our discussion of music. Next week, I'm going to go on to the second half of book three, where Socrates talks about another form of education, gymnastics. And just as with music, music is on the surface story. This is what he's calling the education of these guardians in the fictitious city he's building. But we have to be asking ourselves, in the analogy to the soul, what does he mean by gymnastics and how does it educate the soul? How does it fit in with music? And that will all be next week. So if you have any questions about anything that I talked about today or anything at all, please feel free to drop me an email or put a comment below. 
As always, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. And also, if you don't already subscribe, I hope you will think about it because I do put out a new video each week and you'll get a notification if you do. And thank you very much and I hope you'll join me next week.